Parks, Mississippi, home of the Mule Train, sits about 90 minutes south of Memphis, Tennessee. The town of Marx was named after Leopold Marx, who left Germany to avoid fighting for the German army. Marx became Quitman County's first representative to the state legislature and served for eight years. He encouraged the Yazoo and Mississippi Valley Railroad to come to the area back in the early 1900s by giving the railroad company at no cost the right of way through his plantation, plus the use of his land. The official founding of the town is considered to be May 12, 1907. Fast forward six years and a black man named Walter Brownlow, accused of attacking a white former's wife, was taken from the town prison by a mob and hanged. That started a tumultuous time for the town that led to even tougher racial tensions in the area and poverty like no one had ever seen. Velma Wilson grew up on a plantation in Marx. History had, it was you know, buried and, and it was to me, it's, it's, it's so significant because it's, you know, you can't erase as a part of our national civil rights history. Wilson came from a huge family, a family of 17. There were a lot of people that lived out on the plantation that, you know, there were day workers. And back then, there were big families. We had no running water. Uh, we had an outside toilet and we didn't have a well. So we would go to the well, uh, our neighbor next door to bring water back and forth. And um, like for bathing, we would catch rainwater to take, take a bath. When I was growing up, we went the whole summer without shoes. We did a lot of playing outside. We made up games. We did hopscotch and jump rope and got a lot of activity. And although Velma knew people treated her differently because of the color of her skin. My expectation of vision of what the world was like was very limited because of, you know, not being exposed to a lot of the outside world. She did not really understand the race relations in that small Quitman County town. Although there were the racial tensions and back then whites were in control, blacks had no leadership roles or anything of that nature. The town to me, growing up in Marx and, and the conditions because of you know, my limited exposure to the outside world, it was, it was all okay. Not a lot to compare uh, how it was, the, the conditions. So, so it was very, very acceptable and we thought it was the norm. The norm for blacks to live on one side of the railroad tracks and whites the other. So the, these railroad tracks here, the blacks lived on that side and the whites lived on this side and they were beautiful homes. As far as the restaurants and all that, they were segregated, so we weren't allowed to go in them. Food was scarce for African Americans back then in Marx. So scarce, Marx was the starting point of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Poor People's Campaign in 1968. Don't look a white person in the eye, or, you know, just stay in those boundaries and you, you won't uh, get hurt. Because when King was here, she was very fearful, not only when he was here, but when the Freedom Riders walked up and down these streets. King learned the residents then only ate beans and cornmeal. It was the poorest county in the United States. In the whole United States, yeah. yeah that was in 1968. It was the poorest, uh, poorest county, and that is why Dr. King came. What King saw brought him to tears. Edelman in particular, sort of painted the picture to get Robert Kennedy to come. And then Robert Kennedy got with Dr. King and said, you, you've got to come and see what I've discovered, the poverty that exists. When King went down on Cotton Street, he had to get into a boat to get to a home where the mother and her, her child was at. He couldn't walk because of the water and, and with the lack of proper drainage. And as you know, history records, that's where he, he cried. He wept on Cotton Street when he saw the horrific uh, conditions of the way people lived. The lack of not having clothes, you know, not being covered properly, no shoes, third world conditions, if you can visualize that, that's what he saw on Cotton Street. So Dr. King organized the mule train a group of demonstrators who rode in wagons from Marks, Mississippi, all the way to Washington, D.C. 
First time I ever seen too many people in my life in one place. It was crawling. Eddie Webster joined the mule train. He was 17 years old at the time. It was hard, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, the way you came up or, or where you came from or whatever, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. You had all type of obstacles in the way. I got curious about what was going on. See, I wanted to see more, learn what was happening, learn more about it. Webster became vice president of the youth committee. When they said, well, we're going to go to D.C. on the mule train. I heard him talk to my mom and signed the papers, but he goes, I went old enough to be on my own, really. And when she signed the release form, I packed up and I, me and the mule went to D.C. Sometimes it was fun, sometimes it, it wasn't so much fun, you know, because, you know, once about every time we go to, you, you almost end up in jail. I stayed in jail ward, I stayed on the street to bleed in. But, you know, it, it was worth it. It was trying to accomplish something. Most times we stop and people be waiting there for, you know, they have food, they get some place to stay for the night and one thing. You know, I mean, people you never knew, never met in your life, you know, but they were working with you with open arms. Anywhere we stop, we always have a church somewhere that we could go to. And then those people there would take so many people home with them and make sure everybody had somewhere to stay, feed you and do everything. on the mule train, <laughs> went all the way. Alan Williams joined the mule train when he was just 16 years old. Well, some way I just felt that that was the right thing to do, you know, during the struggle. I seen how things were going on, and I figured it was leading towards the, the struggle that we were going through, you know, and, and the way that things was then, you know, and I figured that might be better things uh, for the black people <laughs> in, in this area. I drove what they call the chuck wagon, the food wagon. We had a little time, but they treated us real nice. And sometimes along the way, they pick, we picked up a few people that wanted to participate, they joined the wagon. We spent the night in churches, that's when some of them would cook. And we slept in churches, and, and that's where we kept the food and stuff like that. We ate, uh -huh, and we had our mattress uh, that we slept on. At that age, Williams didn't see danger. I kind of enjoyed it, you know, and to me it was exciting. And at that age, you know, and to me it was like a camping trip or something like, you know, and everything. And I just enjoyed it. But the ride did not come without scary moments. The Mustang pony, and they was kind of wild. Them the ones that ran off when that big truck, we was on the, almost the base when that big truck came through blowing, and uh, it ran off with the wagon. We spent the night in Alabama in a church. And well, I didn't know it at the time, but Bowling, we got up that morning full daylight and hooked up the mules and wagon. Bowling, he said, y'all just don't know. He said, I didn't sleep a wink. There was no Ku Klux Klan, the white folk were, were, were located. We just said, get them up, <laughs> and, and went on, you know. But so far, that's the only time I was kind of a little, little skeptical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we got out of Alabama. Webster said Alabama was a tough area to ride through. The roughest night I had. Five bombs and shooting and everything. And you skip because when you be riding along, you might get five bombs and anything, you know. Although we had state trooper escort, but they still they didn't stop they, they, because they, they didn't stop nothing and because they really didn't really care. Webster was glad to reach Georgia. I stayed at the house. When we, when we got there. In Georgia? Yeah. And then we stayed there and then we left there and went on to come on, kept on going until we got into D.C. But how many women went on this trip with you all? Oh, quite a few women. Betty Crawford's cousin was one of the women and Bertha Burris kept notes of the journey. A journal. Yeah. A journal noting each stop along the way. Our mule train, we left March, May 13, 1968 at 3.30 p.m. The first stop eight miles west of Batesville. From Marks, Mississippi on May 13th, 1968, to Batesville, Cortland, Grenada, Duck Hill, Winona, Kilmichael, and Yapura, Mississippi, where she notes the first encounter of trouble with the sheriff's deputies. Then on to Starkville and Columbus, Mississippi, to reform Alabama through Tuscaloosa, Cottondale, Bessemer, Birmingham, Anniston, and Brenham, where they were stopped by state troopers. Onward to Douglasville, Georgia, Atlanta, 
They got on the train in Georgia and rode through um, Arlington, Virginia. They got off the train in Arlington, Virginia, hooked the mules and wagons back up. And finally, their 19th stop in Washington, D.C., a wagon ride for exactly one month. You are documenting this mule train ride. Yes. Tell me why. Because it's important. it was important to my cousin. The death of President Kennedy kind of overshadowed this. Dr. King was assassinated too. The mule train left Marx May 13, 1968. And of course, Dr. King had been assassinated. He was assassinated on April the 4th. So he was here twice organizing the campaign before his assassination. Ralph Abernathy became the president. And then he was here along with Jesse Jackson, uh, a lot of other Andrew Young was here. Even Sidney Poitier was here at one time, in, right here in Marks, to help carry out the campaign that Dr. King you know, wasn't able to finish. So they, they saw this as being an opportunity, sort of a memorial to him by, by carrying it through. Crawford wants to make sure the story isn't forgotten either. She has turned her cousin's notes into mementos so people will never forget. From quilts, to drawings and reefs. On the reef, uh, the shape of the state of Mississippi, it shows the route of the mule train from Marx to the um, state line in Alabama. What is this made of? This is made of foam. This is made of moss, like you put in pots. If you put water on it, it would try to grow. And this is talking about when Dr. King was here. This brings us from 68 up to the present day, which was the year 2000. From this artwork to a blues quilt. So what does blues have to do with Marx? Uh, the connection of the blues is forced to living conditions. Uh, when I was 16, okay. we just had in inside plumbings for the first time. We moved out of my grandmother's house on Cotton Street and we moved to Kimbrough Street. So you Which were on was the street when Dr. Martin Luther King came and he wept because he saw the living condition. When people in Marks decided to join the mule train, they were thrown off the plantations. They ended up here in a field known as Tent City. Tent City over here, that's where they had they went had to go stay. And when Williams returned from the trip, he was told... I was living uh, up the Hinkley with my father on a farm. And, uh, you know, back then... Uh, a lot of people living on plantations, uh, when they found out that if they participated in, in that, they had to, had to leave, leave the plantation, had to move. People had talked to my daddy and told him, you know, I, I never get no threat, but you'd be the best for me to, you know, just kind of stay away, you know, stay somewhere else. 68, it was kind of rough in this area, and white folks didn't put, you know, it kept too much for that movement to push people, especially black people, participating in something like that. There was a lot of fear, a lot of fear. Can you can imagine 1968? Because there were people living on plantations that depended on, you know, live, the housing that was probably free. I mean, it was free, and but they had to work in order, to, you know, to, to live in those houses, and they got paid very, very little wages to do that. So if they were caught participating, you know what would happen, right? They would end up losing their home and where to stay. The whites in particular did not want King here. As a matter of fact, there was some staging of situations to show that the poverty didn't exist, that he was painting a, a poor picture of what it was like here, but, but, it, but that was not true. They did not want him here. The history and what King did, even today, is a black eye to the whites. A lot of them have, you know, gone on, they've left this earth, but some of the, the feelings or uh, it was passed down, some of that history, some of, some of that hatred was passed down, you know, to, to the generation that exists today. It was not a good time for the community because they didn't want the world to see what King saw. So was the mule train worth the effort? And did it change anything for the city of Marx? The eyes of the people opened up for a minute. A great man came here, but when he left, 
He died, his dreams died with him. And everything in this town just went back to the normal standstill. All these years and nothing really changed. The last 50 years like things went like we're going back to where we started at. This community, this town, we don't have a grocery store, we don't have a hospital. On a job around here, you don't need applications for us on the phone. What we got? We don't get on the show for nothing we don't want to struggle for. We decided to verify Mr. Webster's claims about Marks, Mississippi in Quitman County. We began with the grocery store. Quitman County is home to many areas that are considered food deserts. That's according to data from the United States Department of Agriculture. Those areas include the city of Marks, the county seat of Quitman, the town of Lambert, the town of Sledge, the town of Crowder, the town of Crenshaw, plus Darling, which is unincorporated. The city of Marks and all the towns mentioned don't have a single supermarket. The entire county is a food desert. So what exactly is a food desert? Remember Velma Wilson who grew up in Marks? She's now the county administrator and explains it for us. A food desert is a uh, area like Quitman County which do not have a grocery store. Basically, it's an area where it's difficult to buy affordable or good quality fresh food. Something 89-year-old Early Melcher knows all too well. You can't buy an onion. <laughs> we followed Mrs. Erling from her Falcon home to her nearest grocery store. Kroger. It was 29 miles away, one way, and in another county. Right now, I have to have somebody take me the Bay for a car still. Drive my car. Are you doing, After she gets food to survive, she runs into another problem after getting the groceries back home. I got milk, cheese, margarine, greens, <laughs> grapes, uh, what is it? water. See, our water system is not real good, so we have to buy water. And according to Quitman County Administrator Wilson, food deserts are becoming a major issue for cities and towns with high impoverished populations like Quitman County. People have to travel to get fresh foods, and produce, about 30 minutes one way, almost an hour round trip. Wilson says food deserts raise obesity rates because people can't buy healthy food. And childhood obesity can lead to students underperforming in school which leads to health issues. 42% of uh, Quitman County faces obesity rate. And not only that, but uh, as far as hypertension, um, a lot of that is caused because of not having those fresh foods. Food deserts are a result of larger grocery stores closing in low-income neighborhoods. But according to Mrs. Melcher, Quitman County's once largest grocer wasn't sufficient. The Brooks had a grocery store, but they weren't equipped with anything. They didn't have fresh vegetables unless somebody brought some in, like green uh, okra for them to sell. According to the 2010 U.S. Census, Quitman County's population is almost 7,300. Most recent data estimates from the census show the racial makeup of Quitman County is 27% white, almost 71% African American. It is still one of the poorest counties in our nation, with a median annual household income of just over $25,000. And it has an alarming poverty rate of 40.9%. The current unemployment rate is 8.7%, which is nearly double that of our national rate at 4.4%. So why are Quitman County and City of Marks, Mississippi still so poor? I mean, it goes back probably to the time when there were sharecroppers or when we lived on plantations. It's just a cycle of, uh, of us not having the financial means to really to pull out of poverty. That poverty, again, having an effect on health care. Remember Mrs. Melcher? I had a heart attack May 23rd. It was May of 2018. Today, Quitman County only has two medical clinics. One is open five days a week, the other only two days a week. The county hospital closed in October of 2016. 
when Mrs. Melcher had a blood clot that blocked blood flow to the heart. I had two falls. They didn't want me to have no fall. They x-rayed me from my toe to my head. She says it was only by the grace of God she survived. So if you get sick, you get a call, ambulance, go to Clarksdale, base for our hospital. She was taken to Clarksdale and told. But when I got sick, they took me to Clarksdale. Then when we get to uh, Clarksdale, the doctor said, we can't do nothing for her. She got to go to Memphis. More than 100 rural hospitals have closed in the United States since 2010, and a recent study says this could have life or death implications for rural communities. The distance that ambulances have to travel to patients after a hospital closes, as well as the limited number of ambulances in rural counties like Quitman County, means that residents there may have to wait for care after a car accident, heart attack like Mrs. Melcher, or other health emergency. Researchers say as a result, mortality rates rise almost 6% in rural areas. Mrs. Melcher was lucky, and today when she needs to see a physician. I have to pay to go to the doctor. I pay a lady and a man and my nephew take me. I buy my own gas and go in my car sometimes. And Mamie White and her nephew has been real nice by taking me in their car. So that's how I get to the doctor. The president of the Board of Supervisors, Quitman County. Manuel Killebrew is Board Supervisor President. When I moved back and I was growing up here in Quitman County, Quitman County was one of the booming areas. We had factories and there was jobs everywhere. I even worked in a grocery store. All those stores have closed and the jobs have left here. The industry closed. We have a lot of people driving to South Haven and Memphis. Then we have Baseville and Oxford where they had to commute to work. And you know, I guess up to uh, South Haven, you're looking at maybe hour and 15 minute drive. How do you get people and businesses to come back? Uh, we just have to go out and solicit people. And I think uh, maybe uh, you sitting here, I'm talking, maybe somebody out there say, hey, we're going to come and help y'all. And that's, 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 that's what we need. We have good people here. We have people willing to work. The workforce is here. Residents say the only new life in the city is the new Amtrak route from New Orleans to Chicago. The train began stopping in Marks on April 4th, 2018, partly because of the mule train historical marker. We have the uh, Amtrak stop here now, which uh, draws people from maybe 50 miles around. Like we have people who used to live in uh, Senatoria and Tunica. They would come to Marks now to catch Amtrak instead of going to Memphis. Senator Wicker and Senator Cochran, who, who is now deceased, and of course, Congressman Benny Thompson, uh, they were champions for the stop. They saw the need uh, no further stop here. If they got a train stop, couldn't they get the county a grocery store, a hospital? We reached out to Congressman Benny Thompson because Quitman County is in his district. It's a work in progress. We do the best we can. For people who criticize and say, but you're my congressman, you're supposed to help me, get me a hospital, get me a grocery store. I said, I'm happy to do it, and I can show you where communities have been able to do it. And if you are prepared to do the hard work, then I'm prepared to get you that facility. But Congressman Thompson says it won't be easy. There are several challenges. Let's start with the hospital. He says getting doctors to work in small rural communities is a task. Then there's the cost. A hospital requires investment, but it requires a certain amount of Medicare, Medicaid patients, a certain number of people with regular health insurance, and paying customers. Plus, there's a, a certificate of need that now you have to apply for to put a hospital in an area. That means that they might say, well, the hospital in Clarksdale or the hospital in Batesville can serve Quitman County. So there are some, some regulatory requirements that you have to meet once you've been closed that you just can't start back up just because you used to be a hospital. 
and the grocery store? Just like any major store, they can say, well, if I'm the only store within 30 miles of here, why would I build a store 10 miles from that store when you could, you're going to end up shopping at my store anyway? So that's that numbers game. If we're going to do that in Marks and Quitman County, Mississippi, the Board of Supervisors, the City of Marks, as well as whatever the economic development entity is for that area, are going to have to say, well, uh, we'll help you find a building. And if, if it's a building that we need to acquire, we might incentivize it by giving you uh, a dollar a year lease on the building. We can say, well, for every person you hire from this community, we'll pay for the training of that person. So for the first 60 to 90 days, you don't have a payroll, but you got to put all those pieces together. And so there's no magic wand uh, for this to happen. And it's, it's a local, locally driven initiative. When a local official doesn't get engaged on problem solving in a lot of instances, that's when those communities don't move forward as fast as they need to. In other words, as the sign reads behind the congressman's head, this is the what. Action planning is the how. He says locals need to start planning and acting. I love this community, and I, I'm looking forward for this community to boom again, and, and, and real soon. Killebrew also joined the mule train, and he said the one thing it taught him. Look at the good in people. Don't look at the bad. And, and, and we, we have the workforce that will work. People will work here if they had a job. He says a grocery store and a hospital would bring jobs back to the area. And this angel statue praying that still sits on the grounds of the now closed hospital is what Killebrew says this county will continue to do. Pray until someone helps or until God sends them another Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. People in Mars, we feel God. That's one thing. Yes. And we, we are a, a, a church grown community. We really believe in God here. We believe in prayer. County Administrator Velma Wilson says the mule train ride that began in Marks, Mississippi may not have brought change to their often overlooked and forgotten city, but it did bring change to the world that many still benefit from today. The impact of the Poor People's Campaign just didn't affect Quitman County in Mississippi. It affected the whole entire country because of the WIC program, the Pell Grants, a lot of initiatives came out of that movement. And from their residents taking a bold stand in the 60s to help the nation, she too is prayerful that others won't quit on Quitman County and will now help them. Thank you.